Uh, hello everybody and welcome to Chef 101. This is an introduction to street cred as a sysadmin and as an open source user. I've been working in a variety of companies from the bluest of the blue chip corporations to four person consulting startups. And for the last few years I've been doing systems administration in web operations environments, deploying applications and setting up systems and, and uh, working with a variety of, of tools and methodologies. Uh, these days, I work for OpsCode doing training and support for Chef. I speak at user groups, conferences, and we also offer online training classes in Chef. Uh, I wrote the majority of OpsCode's published Chef cookbooks. Uh, those are available on our site, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So the problem space that, that we're going to talk about is that infrastructure operations in general is moving fast, and it, web operations specifically relies on infrastructure being available as a platform for hosting the applications. And systems administrators need to be able to adapt quickly to the needs of the business. So we promote this idea of infrastructure as code, where we treat the infrastructure as an application itself that is crucial to the business being able to run and adapt and cope with the ever-changing world of technology. And when we, when we talk about infrastructure as code, this is the automation that we use uh, with Chef, it, we, we write the code and Chef uses it to automate various aspects of the system. So the, the dry academic definition of infrastructure as code might go something like this. It is a technical domain revolving around building and managing infrastructure programmatically. But really what it means is we need to enable reconstruction of the business from nothing but a source code repository the application backup, and bare metal resources. And by bare metal, that can be either physical systems sitting in a rack, or it can be cloud, cloud systems that were provisioned via an API call. So when we talk about this uh, rebuilding the business, we, we, we consider that the prime constraint in, in bringing the business back up and running or, or deploying it in the first place and, and managing it is that the primary time constraint should be how long it takes to restore application data. And with Chef being a, a reusable tool, we are able to do, to do all the other stuff, the, the configuration of servers, and then uh, get the systems back up and running and then restore the backup. So the, the way that we develop the infrastructure as an application is with Chef. At the highest level, Chef is a library for configuration management. Every aspect of Chef starts out as an API, and then Chef provides that library to work on top of the API. As a result, Chef becomes a complete configuration management system. And through the, the data that, that Chef can store on the server side, it becomes a systems integration platform. And by that we mean you can connect different disparate services, such as your monitoring and trending tools, to your to, to know about your systems that they need to monitor. Or load balancers can can discover what web servers need to be configured. And together, all this provides a complete API for the entire infrastructure. So a brief list of some of the core principles behind Chef's design. So first of all, it is idempotent, which is the mathematical principle that multiple applications of the same action do not change the outcome. So every time you run Chef, it does only what it needs to configure the systems as they've been defined. So if you tell a package to install and it's already installed, then Chef will, will detect that and continue moving on to the, to the next part of the code that you've written to configure. Next, Chef is reasonable, and it has same defaults that are easily changed. You know more about your infrastructure than Chef does, so you can have it configure your systems in a way that's meaningful. And if you're not able to configure your systems in a way that's meaningful with Chef, then we consider that to be a bug in Chef, and we want to get that fixed. Since Chef is an open source tool, and it's open sourced under the Apache 2 software license, it's very hackable. We have over 120 or 150 contributors who have signed our contributor license agreement that, that have contributed code to Chef and people are making it better for everyone every day. So we're really proud of the, the, uh, the hackability nature of the tool itself 
and the, the open source uh, community that we've built around that. And finally, Chef embraces the, the Perl community's idea that there should be more than one way to do anything you want to be able to do. So when you approach solving an infrastructure automation problem, it might be a, you might have a different approach than somebody else. So Chef allows you to utilize your approach and so instead of being confined into somebody else's opinion or way of doing things. Now it does provide some some sane defaults, and you can compl you can totally change the way that it behaves in order to fit your infrastructure better. So in the OzCon tutorial, I'll I'll spend a full three hours uh, going over a tour of Chef and talking about uh, all these things in a in a more detailed view. But for now, let's take a, a brief and broad overview about how the different aspects of Chef work. So first of all, the Chef client runs on your systems. This is the Chef client uh, program, and it can run in, run as a daemon on an interval. It can run in cron, or you can run it manually. And the Chef client is what what you actually run to configure your systems. Your systems then talk to a Chef server, and the Chef server provides data and code that is meaningful to your infrastructure. So each of these Chef clients, when, when they talk to the server, they also save their state to the server so that it knows about their IP addresses and, and other, other data about them. And then that's all stored in JSON format that can then be used with an, a RESTful API to, to discover other, to, to be searched for and, and discover other aspects of, the, of systems. You can also run Chef in solo mode, which is standalone and doesn't talk to a Chef server. Uh, there's certainly a number of companies and people that are doing this, but really the, the big benefit of Chef uh, as an integration platform is being able to have that data published and available to other systems in your infrastructure. So whether you're running Chef client with a server or you're running Chef solo, each system that you run Chef on is, is called a node. This is just a, a, an object that, that represents a configuration state of a particular system or object within your infrastructure. Nodes themselves have data called, that we call attributes. This is some JSON representation of data from a laptop uh, running Mac OS X, and it has as you can see, the kernel and some information about the kernel. There's the IP address and the host name is in there. There's a MAC address, and we can see what the uptime in seconds was when, when it saved this uh, it saved this data to the Chef server. And we can see that it's running on Mac OS X, so uh, Chef does run on Mac OS X. Um, it also runs on a variety of other Unix and Linux platforms, as well as also running on Windows. And the the data discovery tool called OHI is what gathers all this node information that is stored on the on the Chef server about each node. These attributes are then searchable. So here we have an example of using the command line tool Knife to search for all the nodes that have the platform Mac OS X. And when I if I ran that command and I had nodes that had that that had that value, then I would see all the nodes that that are uh, OS 10. I can also put the search in uh, in a Chef recipe with a little bit of Ruby code here that, that looks very similar to the search from from Knife, and we're going to search all the nodes for platform Mac OS X, and that would return an object, or we, we could iterate over the object within a recipe. Nodes also have a run list. And the run list is an array that contains the roles and recipes that are applied in the order. So when Chef runs, it goes through the run list and it, it adds those roles to the things that it's going to configure on the node. And since it's an array, it's processed in order from zero through however many entries there are. Here's an example of the, the run list in JSON where we've got uh, a ro three roles, one that represents that this node is a web server, it's also a database master, and it's in development. Since we can, we, since we typically want to, you know, have one system, we may want to have one system in development that it's both the web server and the database master since 
we don't want to waste resources running multiple systems for just testing and developing things. So nodes can also have roles. These are an abstraction that describe the specific configuration function uh, for the node. And you can, uh, uh, of course, apply multiple ro roles to a node. So the roles describe what the node should be, whether it's a web server or a load balancer or a database server. Typically, we write these roles using a Ruby DSL, and then this is converted into JSON when, it, when it's sent to the chef server. So here we have a web server role that, that it has a run list with, some, with another role and some recipes that are going to be applied. Line 6 has a, has a typo. There's a missing bracket on the end there. But um, assuming that we, we fix the typo, then we'd be able to apply the, whatever is in the base role and also the recipes Apache 2 and the Apache 2 mod SSL. Then we're going to set some default attributes. So we're going to have Apache 2. Uh, we're going to configure it to listen on ports 80 and port 443. And then we also have an override attribute that on, on all the, the servers that have this role applied, they'll have the, that max children setting set to 50. Now, the difference between default and override attributes is that the default attributes, you can override those by setting them directly on the node itself. So recall that the the node object has JSON attributes. When the role is uploaded to the chef server, it is indexed for search similar to nodes. And we can search for all the roles that set that max children setting to 50 with this particular query. So again, this uses the knife search command. And this time we're going to search the role index for the max children attribute set to 50. We can also do that within a recipe. And we can do some other kind of processing based on what, uh, what roles come back from that. Roles have a run list, as we saw, which can contain other roles, such as the base role in, in the previous example, or recipes that, like the nodes run list, are applied in order. So order matters, and we want to make sure that we apply things in the correct order so that we can get our systems configured in a meaningful way. So when we're writing recipes, we're, we're doing this to manage resources on nodes. And resources are an abstraction that we feed this data into. And we, we write the recipes, uh, which are the collection of resources of the things that we're going to configure. So for example, on this slide, we have, uh, we have two example resources on the right-hand side. First is the package resource. And the second is, the service, is a service resource. So each resource has a given type package, service, and there's several others. There's over 20 different types of resources in all. Each resource has a name. So we have package sudo, and we have service slap d. And then we have parameters. So the sudo package has the parameters of version and action. And the service slap d resource has the parameters of supports and action. The action parameter is, a, is special, and it tells the the resource to be in a specific state. So we're going to tell that when we use this recipe, we're going to have the package sudo be installed. And we're going to have the service slap d enabled and started. Other actions are, are available for various resources, depending on the, the way that the resource has, has been written and uh, the resource type and it, the providers that are available to it. So providers are what take the action for the resources. So resources take, the, take that action through the provider. And the provider are an abstraction for resources that run the commands or make a library API calls to configure the resource, resource as described. The provider knows how to actually perform these actions to configure the resource. And there may be more than one provider for a given resource. For example, packages can be installed in a variety of ways on Unix and Linux platforms through YUM or AFT or RubyGems, Mac ports, FreeBSD's ports, and so forth. 
and each of these providers has the knows about the specific commands that are required are are uh, used within the provider to to run that on the system. So if we're using the apt provider for a package, then it will run apt get install to install that package. Or if we're using yum, then it'll use yum install. Each each resource can specify a provider to use instead of the default. So normally we have uh, a set of default providers that are available to each of the different resource types. And then if we want, we can override the provider parameter with the provider parameter on the resource. So for example, here we've got the package sudo, and perhaps we want to use yum to install sudo on this particular system. The nodes platform is what determines which provider to use. So here we have a, an example of the, ha the lookup hash that, that maps the, the resources to the specific providers. So if we're on a Red Hat system, and we've detected that with, the, with OHI as a node attribute when, when Chef ran, then we, we look at, at the default version of Red Hat for the service resource, the cron resource, package resource, and the MDADM resource, and we map those to specific providers. Cron and MDADM don't have a, a Red Hat specific provider, but service and package do. So for the Red Hat service, that knows how to use the service command and the check config command to manage init scripts on Red Hat systems. The package provider here is yum, which knows how to use the various yum commands to query the state of the system for packages and to also perform package installations. So in short, the resources are mapped to the provider through the platform. In Chef, we talk about recipes, and these are just lists of Chef resources. And when we load the recipes to the, to the system from the run list, Chef evaluates them for resources in the order that they appear, and then adds those to a resource collection. So here we have a, a short recipe that has a package resource and a template resource. And when Chef processes this, this recipe, first it will add the, it will process the package sudo resource, and then when it comes along to the template here at line 25, the template Etsy sudoers, it will process this resource. Here we have some more examples of parameters that are available within the, uh, the template resource. So once they, once the resources are, once the recipes are loaded in, uh, by Chef and the resources are processed, they're added to an object called the resource collection. And this resource collection looks kind of like a big array. Really, it's an indexed hash that has a specific index. As each resource is added to the collection, it, it, it increments the index. And then when, it, when Chef runs, it processes the resource collection. And it takes the specified action for each of the resources that configures it as it was written in the recipe. So on the previous slide, we saw that the action for package is to install. The template resource here doesn't have an action specified. So resources can use a default action that, that's implied. And in the case of template, it's just going to create the template. That's the action for the template resource. And so when the resource collection processes template Etsy sudoers, then it will create that template because that's the default action that's been specified in the code. The recipe order matters. You need to think about when you're writing your recipes, the order that you're going to do things because you, when you configure a system, you can't just put a, put a config file out and expect it to just work. You have to install the package and run the service that's going to use that, that template. So when you're configuring a, for example, this, uh, this clip of a recipe configures a, a Rails application called Radiant, and it's going to do a, a, a variety of things. We, we need to think about, well, what, what else do we need to have available in order to, to configure this particular application or, or uh, if you're configuring some other service? So here we've got, uh, we've got setting the app name to Radiant, which is just a mnemonic so that we can uh, reuse, reuse that later without typing it out the same way again. Um, and then 
we're going to include a number of other recipes here that are going to be added in line in order that, that they appear within this, within this uh, recipe. So we'll, we'll come along here at line 20, we set the app name, then line 22, we require the chef deploy, which is a, another library, and then lines 24 through 29, each of these include recipes, are going to take the recipe code and all the resources that those recipes contain, and it will insert them into the, the resource collection at this point. Since, uh, since chef's, recipe, chef's recipes are uh, a Ruby DSL and we can use things uh, like iterating over this, uh, loop looping over this list of uh, config, log, PIDs, SQLite, and system, for each of those directories, we're going to create a directory resource for Radiant under the shared directory. And we're going to set up some additional parameters for that. And so when, when we, we hit this particular block of code in the recipe, Chef will process it and it will add a directory resource to the resource collection for each one of those. And then those will get processed by the directories provider and it will do a, a make dir on the system. It actually uses a, a Ruby library to do it, but effectively it just creates a directory structure as, as it was written there. So all these recipes, along with the other assets, such as the templates and, and other files, are all packaged up in what we call cookbooks. And Chef cookbooks are what we consider to be packages for recipes, similar to gems for Ruby libraries or RPMs for installing software and, and other, other uh, commonly distributed components within infrastructures. So Chef cookbooks are distributable and they represent your infrastructure as code. So when I talked about writing our infrastructure as code and, and having a source code repository, we would put the, we would put the Chef cookbooks into, this ver, into a version control repository and then we track it like source code where we do branching and merging and collaborating with other systems administrators and or developers within our operations or within our company's development teams in order to control to configure our systems in a meaningful way that we can run our application. And since it's a source code repository, we would want to have that hosted and backed up somewhere, either on an internal server or on a, on a private service such as GitHub or Gitosis or some other site that we can then, if, if there are disaster strikes, we can rebuild the infrastructure from scratch using nothing but this, this Chef repository. So what goes into these cookbooks that, that we're writing? So we've talked about recipes, and I've mentioned files and templates, and those are assets that are used to, that represent either static or dynamic configuration. And we also can, uh, cookbooks can also contain attributes files, which describe more data that is specific to the, to the cookbook. So you're, you could have an Apache cookbook that sets Apache specific attributes that could be dynamic and change between your systems depending on how you might need to configure them. So you might have a specific directory that systems in production use for deploying their the uh, Apache V hosts, or you might have the Apache directory for development be, be somewhere else, say on like an NFS volume that is, the, is then shared. You, Cookbooks also have metadata, which provide hints about the cookbook, such as the other cookbooks that it depends on or information such as the license which it's distributed under. Since cookbooks are shareable and, and uh, distributable, we, we assign them a, a license that determines how that cookbook can be shared. So OpsCode has this cookbook site, cookbooks.opscode.com, where you can download cookbooks that other people have written and shared under their favorite open source license. We use the Apache 2 license for our, our cookbooks, but you could use GPL or MIT or BSD license or uh, any, any other of your other favorite licensing or put your own license in, in and as long as you're free to distribute the code. Uh, and you can also uh, keep your code private and, and not share it, um, but we, we found that people in, in that are working with an open source tool all are 
tend to share their the things that they've worked on with others so that other people can benefit and help improve the ecosystem in general. So now that we've taken a quick tour of Chef's features, let's take a, a, a look at how we work with Chef to configure systems in our infrastructure and some of the best practices from our community. So the general workflow we recommend is, is pretty basic. First, you set up a Chef repository, which is where your configuration will live. This is the source code repository that I mentioned in the infrastructure as code example. And this is where you, you will download and, and create your cookbooks, or you'll download them from the, the OpsCode cookbook site or from uh, other users that have shared them on GitHub or wherever else cookbooks may be found. Uh, then you can use Chef's command line tool, Knife, to interact with the API to either query the server for information that you're going to use within your, when you're writing your cookbooks, or to upload those cookbooks to the Chef server that you then use to configure your systems. So OpsCode provides this Chef repo repository on GitHub, and it has a, a skeleton directory structure, and each of these directories has a readme that describes what it's for. And it also has a rake file, which we can then inter use to interact with the repository itself. Rake is the Ruby world's make tool, and the rake file actually has a bunch of tasks that are installed from the chef code. So when you install chef, it has a file in it that contains a number of the rake tasks that are used by this rake file. And it can do things like manage uh, creating the creation of new cookbooks and, and set up the, the whole directory structure or uh, manage uh, the cookbook metadata or work with the roles that, uh, that are created using the Ruby DSL. So the, the cookbook site provides uh, a lot of cookbooks and recipes for managing a wide variety of infrastructure. And you can configure, you can download cookbooks for everything from Apache to Zookeeper from the site uh, and managing a, uh, MySQL and Nginx and DNS services, Amazon Web Services components, and, and many other things. And Knife has, has a subcommand that you can use to download directly from the cookbook site and install those cookbooks into your Chef repository, and then you can track them uh, along with your the cookbooks you've created yourself. So while sometimes there, there while there's a lot of cook there's a lot of cookbooks on the cookbook site, and uh, what what OpsCode has published and what other users have published to try to be as complete as possible, sometimes. Uh, something that you, you want to configure in your, in your infrastructure isn't available. So let's take a look at some of the approaches to writing recipes that, that uh, the tutorial at OSCON will go into, there, you can go into, we'll, we'll go into more detail on how we do this in the tutorial at OSCON. But just the, the, the brief overview, when we're writing recipes, we'll want to determine the data that's required about the node. So we're going to want to know uh, perhaps the IP address or the host name of a node, or be able to, to search the nodes for meaningful data that we then are going to put into these declarative resources that we use to configure aspects of the system. And then after we've, we've written the resources in, in the recipes, we'll create the needed assets. We'll copy the templates and modify them as needed, or we'll, we'll put a tarball or a directory in the cookbook that we're going to distribute to the, to the systems that are going to configure whatever service we might be working with. So when we're looking at the application data that we, that we need, we might need to know where the source repository is, or uh, the IP address, or the host name, or how much memory is available on the system or deploying an application besides the source repository, we might need to know the deploy keys or the, the roles of the different servers that are in the application stack. So we looked earlier, we had a, a, a database master role. So we might want to know about that and have that stored within the application data that we're going to use within our recipe. Then we're going to write the resources in our, in our recipe. Here's the, the briefest examples uh, 
that we that we use for perhaps packages. So maybe we, we're going to install package Apache 2, or we're going to install the gem, the Rails gem, to to deploy a Rails application. And we have configuration files that that we gathered this data, and now we're going to populate these configuration files like a database.yaml file that tells the Rails application how to talk to the MySQL database. Or we ha we're using the Unicorn web server to run our Rails application, so we need to have my application's Unicorn config set up so that it can launch and run, run the web server. So we've got the, those templates were, were in the recipe, now we actually need to create those templates within the cookbooks slash my app cookbook and we have the templates default directory with the ERB templates that are that are going to be used uh, to configure those particular components of the from the recipe and then we bundle all that up the, the assets and the recipes and anything else that we've put into this cookbook and we upload that cookbook to the chef server apply that recipe to the to the nodes run list where we want it configured and then we watch as our Rails application is installed or our database server is installed and created and, and is up and running and is ready to serve traffic for, for our application. So we're talking, we, we talk to the Chef server's API in order to upload the cookbooks and we also work with the API to create and assign roles such as the my application role or web server role and, and so forth and then we manage the systems run list we add those roles to the run list and then we run chef on them to configure them to be what they need to be the tutorial for chef at OSCOM is going to cover all these concepts and more in greater detail with uh, with uh, explanations about the various terms and, and tools that we use. We'll take a hands-on look at running these commands to get set up with the Chef repository, and we'll, I'll write a couple simple recipes that, that go into greater detail, and we'll see them in action on configuring systems with Chef. Also take a look at how OpsCode uses Chef itself to dynamically configure load balancers and monitoring software that we use within our infrastructure so that we can detect uh, systems and integrate them together uh, in the infrastructure and and take decoupled components and loosely couple them together. Are there any questions? Hey Joshua, did you see that question yeah. from Gordon? Okay. Yes. There uh, was someone talking about using Puppet at the beginning. So. Okay. All right. Uh, so the question is, care to position Chef versus Puppet and CF Engine? Uh, so Chef is Chef is uh, the latest in in the uh, configuration management tool list. Uh, CF Engine has been around for a while, and then Puppet uh, came along, and now Chef has come along. Um, we, we do have some, some similarities to Puppet, but we also have some important differences. And the important differences between Chef and Puppet are the pure Ruby DSL that Chef uses for the recipes. Then also that the Chef server itself is very lightweight. It's, it's really just a file server and, and, a, and API endpoint that the, that the clients talk to. Whereas the and doesn't do any of the the heavy lifting or the work, the with Puppet the Puppet Master compiles the configuration and sends it to the to the clients. But with Chef, the clients do all the work. They get the the uh, they get the the cookbook code and then they process the the cookbooks. The uh, the other difference is that with Chef the order that you write your recipes in and the order that you apply them in the run list is the order that they will be configured on the system. So if you put SSH before Apache 2, then SSH gets configured before Apache 2. And Chef's principle is that, it, one of Chef's other principles that it has is that when it encounters an error, when it, when it has a problem configuring a resource, it will exit the run completely and 
you have to rerun, you have to fix the error in order to rerun Chef. So if you have a syntax problem in a template or a remote package repository is unavailable, then you have to work around or fix that error before you can run Chef again. Whereas with Puppet, it will continue on and configure other things. The security between the Chef server and its clients is asked by Tiago. So the authentication model between Chef server and the clients is RSA style keys. Uh, the Chef server itself stores the public half of the key and the client stores the private half. And Chef has a validation certificate that's available, that uh, a validation client that can be used to automatically validate new clients. And that validation client can only be used to create new non-administrative clients. So you can automatically provision new nodes without having to manually create the client, or if you want, you can create the client manually, and that, that's with a RSA key pair. Daniel asks, if you don't have a big structure and want to automate deploy for small apps, like simple virtual private servers, do I recommend Chef Solo? Uh, Chef Solo is, if, if you've got a very small infrastructure and you're only working with a couple of systems, Chef Solo is usually pretty sufficient for that. Um, but as you, as you grow, and infrastructures invariably will grow at some point, um, then when you start trying to maintain the uh, setup to, around Chef Solo, it starts to look suspiciously like you're setting up a Chef server. So at, at some point, you'll, you may want to evaluate whether you're going to use a Chef server versus uh, continuing with Chef Solo. MR says, can Chef coexist with Capistrano or can it be seen as a replacement? Uh, yes and yes. Um, so Chef itself has a deploy resource that has its guts taken from Capistrano. And that Chef deploy that we saw in that earlier example uh, is an early version of that. The current version of Chef has a full deploy resource that supports being able to roll back and do timestamped or revision-based deploys, uh, checking out from uh, subversion or Git repositories. And so you can run Chef recipes to do deployments like Capistrano, but you can also use Chef to set up your directory structure and uh, your, your other parts of your configuration in order to run your application that you then deploy with Capistrano. So you can use either one. Uh, will the full presentation be available? I'm, uh, Carmen asks, I'm interested in seeing how we de handle deploying applications and how to use Chef with load balancers. Uh, we, Carmen, we have a, a example of uh, configuring HA proxy on our blog by our, uh, it, it's a screencast by our CTO, and it uses HA proxy to, uh, with Chef and, it, and search. So if you, wanted to, if you want to take a look at our blog, you can see that example. Um, I'll be going through that in more detail at, during the OzCon tutorial. So if you're able to make it to OzCon, I uh, recommend you stop by the tutorial and, and check that out. Uh, we also run webcasts where we'll be doing more application deployment examples and, and other recipes. Uh, so that, that's on our, on our blog. Uh, we make our announcements there. Uh, Hussein asks, is a clean installed server needed to install Chef or is a migration on a running server to, on a running server, server to Chef possible? So uh, we recommend running a, a freshly installed system and then configuring it from the ground up with Chef so that you have uh, you don't have other cruft running from other services and it, you, so you don't have the syndrome of the server in the closet that's been running for 40 years that nobody knows what it does, but the last time they turned it off, it destroyed the infrastructure. So um, we recommend uh, a clean install of, of a server for Chef. You can migrate a server that's been running something else. Um, there, there are people that have in the Chef community that have switched from Puppet or CF Engine servers to running Chef servers on the same system without an OS reinstall. Um, but we de definitely recommend a, a clean slate to start from. Any other questions?
I think we have a couple more questions coming in, Joshua. There was one from Nathan. Yes, I see that. Okay, Nathan, uh, what about system updates from upstream? Do you mean uh, from dis handling distribution package updates, or do you mean from updating Chef itself? Distribution updates. Okay, so with Chef's package resource, most of the package providers support the action to upgrade packages. So when you write the packages, in, uh, package resources in your recipes, you can specify to upgrade, and you would need to have something like uh, early in your run list to do an app to get update to ensure that the package repository is is uh, cache is updated on a on a Debian or Ubuntu system, or with uh, with with Red Hat family systems, Yum will rebuild the cache every time it runs. So uh, you should you should have the the latest ver information from the repository about what packages are available, so you can have the pack specific packages in your recipes be updated uh, via the package resource. You can also drop off, say, a, a cron file that, that handles your uh, caching updates and, and maybe OS upgrades. Um, I, I've found over, over 12 years of doing this that automated distribution upgrades are potentially dangerous and can lead to, to unforeseen consequences. Um, so I, I prefer personally to do rolling upgrades or in the case of using cloud-based systems, uh, upgrading a particular environment to a new version, say uh, going from Ubuntu 9.10 to Ubuntu 10.04 uh, in, in a specific environment, testing that the application works there, and then rolling that out. And since we're, we're using an, an infrastructure automation tool that can rebuild our entire infrastructure easily with the only constraint being the data backup and restore, then we can bring that new infrastructure up and running very quickly. All right, we have a question from Lucas also about uh, Chef server redundancy. He's yes. not specific. Uh, Lucas, yeah, so the Chef server itself is a MERB web application, and it scales like a web application. The server behind the scenes has a few other components. There's a uh, the search indexing feature and the data store, um, both uh, are built on scalable components. Uh, the search indexing is built on Solar, and the data store is built on CouchDB, both of which uh, have well-documented ways of scaling and expanding those out. Uh, the Chef server itself can be run, uh, the, the API runs in front of the Solar index and uh, so Solar search engine and the the CouchDB, so uh, all it has to do is know about those components and be able to talk to them, and then you can build multiple systems that it would run, and it's, it scales just like a web, like a Rails web application would, or or a Merb web application. Okay, great. Um, do you see the question from Tiago? He's he's asking on the blog. I've seen you have an introduction to Chef web presentation. How's that different from today's? Yeah, so the, the sh introduction to Chef web presentation is, uh, it, it's not as, it doesn't cover all the uh, different components a as much. Uh, it's more of an introduction on how to get started with downloading and installing Chef and then using the Ops Code platform as the Chef server. Okay, well, I, it looks like we're running out of questions, but. Um, Joshua, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation on this. I'm just curious, I did ask in the chat room and, and no one really answered if anyone here is using Chef now because it seemed like this was a timely introduction that a lot of people are new to it altogether. So mm -hmm. can can I just see any yeses or nos? Is, has anyone used, is anyone using Chef at this point or not yet? Not yet. That's the right answer. So. So that's, oh good, I, well I hope you found this, this uh, helpful, you're certainly getting the information from the right man. <laughs> Got a couple yeses. 
Well, good, good. So, Joshua, again, thank you so much. It's great to be able to yeah. provide this kind of information. And your uh, your tutorial at OSCON will be on Monday, is that correct? Um, I believe it's on the Tuesday. Okay, 50-50 chance of <laughs> getting that right. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's on the I think it's on the tutorial day. Uh, let's see. It it's is on. Definitely worth attending. Um, I would suggest checking out Joshua's tutorial. And uh, I put a PDF of the OSCON brochure up there if you want to download it. It comes with a code for 20% off. And I think Mary posted that in the chat room also. Great. So, you know, it's, it's, OSCON is one of my favorite conferences that we do all year. Great one to attend. So, enough said about that. I'm sure anyone who can will attend. And Joshua, um, so I'll look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, and, should be a good time. And, yeah, definitely. And um, what else? I'll, so once again, I just want to say thank you to everyone, and especially to you, Joshua. And we will send a link out with the um, with the link to the recording as soon as we have that available. It will probably be sometime tomorrow or the next day. It, we have a little backlog now, but as soon as we can get that, we'll send it out. And that's about it. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. Um, that's, I'm going to close the meeting out now. <laughs>